as we all um, sit or stand in our um, workplaces around the world in operating in the sector of staging major international events, we, we dare to ask the question, is local the new global? So I'm very pleased to welcome our speakers to the panel today. Um, we're delighted to be joined by Billy Garrett, who's Director of Sport and Events and more, as I understand it now, at Glasgow Life. Um, we'll find out more from Billy about his um, increased remit and how it relates to the topic under discussion today. Um, thank you to, to you, Billy, and Glasgow Life for your support of Host City and the hosting of it in this virtual environment. And um, Jennifer Arnold. Um, hello, Jen. Nice to see you, Jennifer. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, Jennifer is the Associate Vice President of Marketing Communications at the US Soccer Foundation. Um, we're also delighted to be joined by Senthil Gopinath, the CEO of ICA, which, as I'm sure many of you will be aware, is the International Congress and Convention Association, the umbrella group for the international meetings industry, if you like. And um, so is local the new global? Um, so to start this conversation, I thought we could ask, um, has the pandemic generate, generated or re-emphasized a sense of community? Did it remind people of the value of society and collective experience? And I think um, it'd be great to get a, a perspective from the, from the United States, Jennifer, actually, to get the ball rolling with this one. Yes, absolutely. Thank you all. It's great to be here um, this morning in the United States on the East Coast. Um, yeah, I think the, the short answer to your question is yes. I think in a kind of meta way, um, everyone had a collective experience of going through the pandemic and uh, experiencing what it was like when connection to society and a sense of community wasn't what we typically um, were used to. And I think regardless of you know where we lived or age, gender, basically any demographic, um, people personally experienced um, what it felt like emotionally, socially, sometimes even physically, to not have the sense of community that we were used to. So because everyone kind of went through that together, I really think um, there's a renewed focus on creating community, whether that's in our workplaces, in events, in activities, but it's gonna be really vital moving forward. Um, in just the couple of events I've been able to go to safely here in the US, um, you know, people are craving this, this sense of community, the being part of something bigger than just themselves. And I think we'll really continue to see that. Hmm. Interesting um, concept there that community is a sense of being something bigger than, than yourselves and how that relates to, to the purpose of, of, of major events, really. Um, so, Billy, from your, your, in your view, um, as um, head of sports and events and communities, I believe, at Glasgow Life, um, what's your take on this? Uh, yeah, so I, 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 not surprisingly, I, um, I, I agree with Jennifer. Um, I, I think... I think this is really quite a profound issue, actually, um, and and in a sense, I think it presents a bit of an opportunity for for for, for us in the sector. Um, you might remember uh, Ben; it's not so long ago in this country that there were politicians saying uh, there's no such thing as society. Um, I think I think what's clear from the pandemic is that that that's not true. Um, I think there's a couple of issues. Um, I, th I think I think what's been demonstrated through the pandemic. I mean, and it's not universal, um, but in general, you have seen a real sense of commitment to the people around about us. You know, arising, if you like. Um, you know, the speed at which assets and resources and skills and you know venues have been repurposed, redirected. Um, you know, to support food distribution or to support vaccination centres or whatever it's been. I think has been really quite profound, and that and that's been pretty much global. Um, but I think, and Jennifer makes makes the right point. I think what's absolutely clear is that, and and Dr. McConnell uh, mentioned this in her keynote address first thing this morning. There's something about the human experience. There is a real longing for. There's a need. There's a requirement for collective experience and engagement. And, and some of us might have realised that beforehand, but that's absolutely clear now. Um, and I think that gives us a real opportunity. Um, if, we, if we can position our sector as one of the key planks, the key elements in recovery strategies around, around the world, um, we tend to focus, you know, quite rightly, we tend to focus on the economic benefits of events or, you know, you know, bed nights, KPIs, you know, eyes on, those kind of things. 
Um, but there's a real opportunity now, I think, for us to focus on a slightly, a slight, you know, complementary but slightly different set of values, slightly different set of measures, which is about recovery, which is about, you know, that, and we're going to talk about this, I think, probably slightly later on, that wider health and well-being agenda and the role that events specifically can play in the recovery from the pandemic. And, and just anecdotally, um, Dr McConnell mentioned the European Football Championships that were held across the UK uh, in, in June, and Glasgow was lucky enough to be one of the host cities. And the response to that event, which is one of the first big major events that we held as we emerged from the worst of the pandemic, I, I wouldn't say we've emerged from the pandemic quite yet, um, the response to that from, from people attending um, and indeed from people working on it from the supply chain, etc., was actually a, an emotional response. You know, I talked to people and it was their first job for over a year. Uh, I spoke to people attending and it was it was a really emotional experience. That's how people were feeling, you know, getting back to events or getting back to working on events. So I think that's something that we can utilise within the sector. You know, that is part of the power that events have. So I think there's something quite profound about this. Absolutely. Um, and Senator, like, like myself, you're involved in the business of um, international conferences and um, exhibitions. And from, from your perspective, are you seeing this sort of phenomenon of a sort of a, a, a renewed sense of focus on the, the local area? Is there, is there perhaps um, a trend towards more domestic or regionalised events? And if so, what, is, is, that, is that trend here to stay? Absolutely, Ben. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, it's a great opportunity for all of us to talk about the community engagement. Uh, just to answer your question, Ben, I think most importantly, uh, the community engagement has taken a structured approach in the in the meetings industry. It has been at the forefront in the last, uh, I would say, from the time pandemic started. Uh, our industry has been thriving on community engagement. We got fantastic opportunities across the globe, like you rightly said, locally and regionally, to engage and bring the communities together. But most importantly, we have been good in bringing the communities together in the past, even pre-pandemic. But now we are trying to look at ways to have a continuous community engagement. And it's a 365 day process. So we are not going to like doing from meetings to meetings. Yeah, it's here to stay and it's going to continue from each meeting to each event. That, that's a great uh, change uh, as uh, trans taken place in our industry in the last 20 months or so. And the community engagement has go gone with a purpose Every uh, meetings uh, we, we conduct, uh, whether it's a digital version or even a hybrid version or even a face-to-face -face, when there is opportunity, the com local communities are engaging much more. And through this uh, engagement, we have achieved a larger audience, which have never been interacting uh, through the communities do, do at the events. So now the, the horizon has become bigger and more and more uh, we have enlarged our community across the world, be it local, be it regional. So if you really see some of the uh, larger associations when they're organizing events, they keep seeing that the uh, audience has become much bigger than pre-pandemic situation. Yes, it could be at a, at a, from a different level and different ways of participation using digital means, but the engagement has become really at the forefront. And then we are reaching out to countries and the communities which we have never reached out in the past. So community engagement has taken center stage uh, in our business. Thank you very much, Santal. <clears throat> and I think we're going to get, get into a bit more detail about examples of um, how events are, are, are creating more community engagement uh, as we get, get into this, um, this panel. But um, <clears throat> I'd be interested to hear more um, from you on specific examples, maybe of perhaps your own international congress or, or some of your members' um, events. Are, are, they, are they staging, are they focusing on sort of large-scale international digital events? Are they still trying to do large-scale international conferences where they're flying delegates from all over the world? Or are they taking different, more regionalized approaches um, from the ICA point of view and your membership? Yeah, I think uh, to begin with, I mean, just if you give a, give, to, to give an example of what we did as ICA, when we want to reach hmm. our community across 100 countries, uh, be it in the year 2020 and 21, what we, we created this multi-hub concept where we looked at the strategic uh, locations in the world where it's it's open for business, where the reopenings have taken place. So we brought the local communities together in those locations. So usually the ECA Congress is just in one country where almost 1,500 uh, industry professionals come together. But here we managed to reach the same number or, or even larger number in different hubs in different parts of the world. So every region had a hub 
and the host city at the main congress. Yes, we couldn't achieve the numbers we usually have in the host city. But having said that, we could widespread and share the knowledge and the best practices across the world in, in all different types of the communities. So that model, the multi hub model really worked. Yes, it was, uh, it was a hybrid model. So it had an opportunity for members to come together and then of course, digitally learn as well. So across all the hubs and the whole city, we were connecting across the world. So you didn't lose anything in learning. Yes, you're not uh, taking a plane to travel, but you had the entire content of the event showcased in your local hub as well. So you had the opportunity of learning, being a delegate, whether you are in uh, Cape Town or whether you are you're, you're in uh, Nagasaki in Japan, the Congress was mm -hmm. in Carter in Colombia, still you could be a part of it. Now, similar approaches we see among the association members and the ECA members as well, because they are taking that approach because they, they felt that the, the pandemic has relatively opened doors to reach wider audience and the audience which cannot afford or which never looked at attending their own conferences. So from organizer point of view, this is a new opportunity and new segment has opened up. Uh, again, we, we could be a short term uh, reach until we all get into a strong face to face events. Um, so this is this model is working across the world among the membership. The other aspect is on your question, Ben, is about regionalized events. Yes, also the borders are closed in many parts of the world and it's reopening in a structured format. It is allowing our members in the region to approach the region through using these models. So it's not only you're hosting international conference, but when you organize a regional congress, you can invite all your regional countries to be a part of it. Uh, in the past, regionalization was very limited, but now regionalize, regionalization and localization is becoming more and more. And that's building a new audience where the associations which were not part of or never understood the Congress business are, are learning more and understanding more and the marketplace is becoming bigger and bigger. Hmm. Interesting. I, I can't help but think what, what that might mean for the rights holders of major sports events who, who might be watching and thinking about this now. Um, I mean, we, we heard Katie Sadler um, speaking earlier in the conference about the, 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 um, the evolution of the, the Commonwealth Games and the Commonwealth Games Federation and <coughs> co-hosting um, potential new models of, of, of um, different places working together to host the Games was potentially part of the mix for for the um, for the Commonwealth Games Federation. So as, as a former host of the um, Commonwealth Games, Billy, in Glasgow, um, and what, what's your sort of take, take on this? I mean, is this is that what the way that sport should be going? Uh, it's it's an interesting question. There's a lot of moving parts, I think, on, in this um, domestic, regional um, kind of piece, um, if you think about it. So, I, I, I mean, there is, for instance, there's a real challenge around the sustainability agenda around some of the big international events. Uh, you know, so Glasgow's just recently hosted COP26. So that agenda is is really, really powerful. And there is growing, let's be honest, there's growing cynicism around the kind of offsetting agenda and what that really means. So so that's something that we need to we need to think about in terms of the that model, you know, people flying in from all from all around the world to, to, to you know to big mm. international events. So there's that piece. There's then um, another narrative um, which you've referred to around the financial model of, of some of the major, some of the world's biggest events and the extent to which there is a pipeline, if you like, of hosts who are willing and able to, to meet the requirements of that model. And I suppose that's the point that, that, that Kate was, was kind of alluding to really. Mm. Um, I mean, there are still uh, hosts out there, but clearly, historically, over the last five, 10, 15 years, the number of cities bidding to host those made, you know, the Olympics, the World Cups, the Commonwealth Games, the numbers are dwindling. You know, they are. So there's an issue there. And then there is the, I, I, I suppose, I don't know what to call it, but the kind of authenticity innovation piece uh, and I say this as, as someone who is, I suppose, um, a host, you know, I'm representing the voice of the host, where hosts are looking to really influence the design of events and, and really looking to see their communities, their aspirations, their characteristics reflected in events more and more. Um, and I think when you, when you put all of those things together, I think, 
I think it will lead to a, an enhanced, not an exclusive, but an enhanced focus on more regional stroke local events, more domestic events. But I think what it also leads to is a real interrogation, real challenge around existing models. Um, mm. And that is about, you know, hosting arrangements, but it's more than that. It has to be more than that. It has to be a challenge around formats. It has to be a challenge around scale. It has to be a challenge around some of the governance arrangements, vested interest issues. I mean, it has to be a real challenge across the board. Um, mm. So, uh, and some of our successes in Glasgow have been around homegrown, um, you know, events designed locally. Uh, uh, Dr. McConnell mentioned Celtic Connections, an entirely homegrown event, which is now the biggest of its kind in the world. Um, you know, uh, and there's others, Merchant City Festival, etc. So it, it can be done. Um, so, so I think I think this is a, a discussion that, that is going to evolve, but it's one that I think we we have to address. Yeah, sure. And I think that, that we we could uh, perhaps, if this time later on, have have a look at maybe the European Championships as a as a as a model of a of a more sort of scalable indeed, um, indeed. Um, approach. But I'm quite quite keen to to hear um, Jennifer's view actually on them because when you're talking about the planning of events and and the need to to to, to build some of these concerns um, into the early stages of of, of event development, um, US soccer <coughs> are hosting, if you like, the um, the National Federation that is hosting the, the World Cup in 2026, the FIFA World Cup in 2026. And um, so are, are you seeing um, this uh, an increased sort of emphasis on this sort of legacy and impact component and, and concerns around community being brought into um, to the cities that are bidding um, for the for the FIFA World Cup in, in the USA? Yeah, absolutely. I think as a national nonprofit at the foundation where we work with communities um, to use soccer as that vehicle for social impact, we very we love the legacy component. Um, FIFA included asked for a legacy component when uh, North America was was bidding on the World Cup that, that we got in 2026. And then there's also a legacy component um, that each city has to submit potential host city as part of their bids. And I think um, the more that cities can be chosen based on, you know, or at least legacy strategy is weighted, you know, with all the other major things, the infrastructure, the financial plans, all that is really great for not only the organizing entity, in this case, U.S. soccer and FIFA, because this large scale event will actually have a lasting impact on um, on the country and the cities that are hosting it. Um, and it's not just bringing the circus to town and leaving it, but you know, it's associating this event with something greater good for society. Um, and that goes mm. the same for the bidding cities. Obviously they have to submit a legacy strategy, but um, we've offered to help any of the potential host cities think this through. And one city we're working really closely with is Houston, um, uh, who's bidding on getting a wor uh, World Cup games there in 2026. Mm -hmm. And they've invested heavily in a legacy strategy from the beginning. Um, they've mm -hmm. committed to, with the foundation and the, the host committee, um, raising $6 million that would go directly into the community to build soccer pitches and uh, expand programming in the lead up to the World Cup. Um, should they get that? And they've already raised half of it. So some of it's already happening regardless of if they get a match or not. And I think this is such a good strategy because it doesn't only align with what the bid is asking for, but it supports um, things that are already in the works and supports all the various stakeholders across the board. So it's supporting uh, government, you know, the mayor is behind it because it's supporting um, his priorities for all Houstonians to have equal access to quality services and amenities. Uh, it's extending the potential um, you know, traditionally the jobs, the infrastructure, the economy that comes with a big event, but it's actually extending the reach to an everyday person that might not, you know, go to the World Cup or benefit from this coming to town because it's it's mm. connecting back and investing some of that money in the communities. Um, for corporations that are involved in the bids in each city, it's not only tying them to this potential global event, but it's supporting their um, so. Uh, corporate social responsibility goals, which are huge for corporations, um, I think globally, but definitely here in the United States, people want to be authentic and actually do good. So it's not only growing excitement in the game, but it's it's a win for everyone because it's hopefully helping get the bid, but it's also reinvesting some of the money that's coming in from that directly into the community, whether people are impacted or not. So, you know, as much as that can be incorporated in, it kind of extends beyond what the benefits of bringing a big event to, to town would be. Mm, thanks, Jennifer. And I think perhaps for, for the benefit of, of our international audience here, many of whom um, 
particularly if you're watching from from Europe, then then um, soccer doesn't. You might not think that football is is necessarily the the, the prime candidate for for investing in local generation because we're all well, we're not all, but a lot, a lot of people are, are are already quite comfortable just sort of picking up a football or joining a local team, and it's and it's already there. But can you perhaps just just explain to us where the USA is at without wanting to sort of um, you know assume that people don't know? But I'm sure there's a lot of people watching that will be interested to find out a bit more about who, who is who is the soccer fan in the US, who is the soccer participant in the US, and what's the opportunity for, for building the sport, not not just for the um, for the international broadcast reach and the and the, the sponsors benefit, but but on a community level as well. Yeah, great. I probably, I probably should have answered that. So um, soccer is the world's game. You know, you only need a ball uh, in the US. Um, it's, it's not the most popular sport. And in fact, it uh, is very costly to play. So there was a great, um, after the 94 World Cup, which was actually when the foundation, we were funded out of the proceeds from that, um, which is another great lasting legacy um, from big events. But um, there, was a, there, was an ex there was a big growth of soccer, specifically in um, suburbs, but rural communities and urban communities, um, there wasn't that growth. And it's, it's actually quite expensive to play soccer in the United States, um, even at the recreational level, uh, even at the, especially at the club and travel level. So the foundation's really focused on, on making soccer and all the benefits that come from a team sport, from having a coach, from having a safe place to play, really accessible um, because we know that it can do, you know, even if you don't make it to the pro level, you can still benefit from being in that team. So yeah, soccer, um, it, it's not the most popular sport, but we would love it to be. And I think um, a lot of times there's a pay to play model in the US that precludes a lot of people from playing. Um, and there's not that access to places to just go pick up a ball and play. So kind of building out that infrastructure as well. Um, mm because it's, it's not the most accessible. And, and the risk of asking another obvious question, just, just very briefly, Jennifer, could just um, <clears throat> expand on that. Um, why why is it a good thing for people to play football um, from a sort of a health and well-being point of view, presumably? What, what's, why, why is this a, something to be aspired to? Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. Really so, I mean, yeah, so, I mean, we've done a lot of research. We work with, we work, um, Soccer just in general, obviously kids are physically active. Um, with the pandemic, it was very hard to be physically active. Even before then um, in the US, kids um, that were um, living with, in families that made less than $25,000 um, American dollars weren't playing sports. So there wasn't these opportunities to be physically active. There weren't opportunities um, to learn healthy habits, to learn you know good eating habits for being an athlete um, or even connect emotionally with a coach mentor. So obviously there's so many um, health benefits, physical health benefits, but also the social benefits and the critical skills like teamwork and perseverance that come from being on that team sport that really can carry um, through. So, you know, mm -hmm. the more people are playing and, and doing that, the, the healthier they'll be, you know, physically, emotionally, mentally. Thanks, Jennifer. You, you, you um, alluded to, to a sort of a kind of a, a class gap or something in, in, in the sport in, in the USA. And um, just to, to, to build on that point of sort of differences in, in income and inequality. Um, I think it's apparent that the pandemic has has worsened inequality. And um, so as a question, Billy, perhaps you might like to touch on is how can hosting events drive initiatives that can help to address these inequalities? Yeah, I, it's really interesting. Um, and and I, I thought it was a really fascinating kind of description that Jennifer gave us of, of the kind of legacy that's that's wrapped around the, the the proposition in terms of the World Cup in the US uh, sounds really, really positive. Um, I think, I, again, I, I think, I, I mean, I, so you're right, uh, there were real challenges around uh, inequality, inequality in terms of health, inequality in terms of access to services, inequality in terms of a uh, whole range of barriers between some of the people in our communities and, and access to a range of services. Uh, that was that was a real challenge before the pandemic. Um, but you're right, what's clear from all the evidence, and I think this is pretty much a global phenomenon, is that those people who were already struggling, those people who were already had, were, were, were being hit the hardest, um, and those people who already faced the most barriers um, have been pushed even, for, even further out, have been pushed even further away. Um, have been hit the hardest, um, and and that's and that's really really um, demoralising, you know. So um, so I think there's a real issue there. It's an issue, if we're honest. It's an issue. This issue about inequality is not traditionally an issue 
that we have seen as part of a, a discussion or a debate around events. We have seen um, a, an evolving discussion around legacy. Um, again, I think I think we're set for a for another paradigm shift in terms of that issue. I think at the moment we have a perfectly positive um, structure where we have events around which are woven some really exciting and positive legacy programs. I think I think the next evolution of that is is to turn the event model on its head, and and you start with the policy proposition. I think. And, and possibly Trudy, the CEO of uh, UCI World Cycling Championships 2023 in Scotland, might have talked about this yesterday. I, I'd like to think that the partners involved in bringing that event to Scotland and Glasgow have done that with the UCI World Cycling Championships. We've started with our policy aspirations. We, we've turned it entirely on its head. We have sold this event to the funders, to the Scottish Government, to the City of Glasgow on the basis of behaviour change, on the basis of a modal shift. And, and within that, a focus on those furthest from engagement, those furthest from activity, those furthest from participation is woven into that narrative. And, and, and I think actually you can begin to see some of that um, reflected in, in some hosts and some other rights owners. So some federations, for instance, are widening their aspirations and moving away from their particular sports and, and beginning to think about a wider health and well-being agenda. I think, mm. I think if we're honest, um, that then you have to talk about targeting. Do you know, the only, the only way that you can deal with that inequality issue is to talk about targeting. You mentioned the European Championships that we hosted uh, in Glasgow and across Scotland in 2018. Um, that, that, in a whole number of ways, that was quite a, that was a really innovative event. It was co-designed and co-produced by the hosts um, and included in terms of legacy, included a whole range of, of quite interesting innovations, one of which was what we called the, the go live concept, where we deliberately blurred the boundaries between sport, physical activity, health and well-being, mental health, food, nutrition, you know, a whole range of things because we realise that, that in order to make an impact at population level, in order to really shift the dial, you have to think wider, you have to think holistically, and you have to think longitudinally. You have to start before and continue afterwards. You have to make things, you, know, you have to give people roots to continue with whatever it is that you think is making a positive impact. We are refreshing that go live concept for the World Cycling Championships in the city. Uh, and some of the programs that we're already running, you know, working with refugees, working with offenders, working with people who've suffered from domestic violence, dis disabled groups, you know, LGBT groups, minority groups. It's about targeting those who are furthest from whatever, you know, from from mainstream and and really focusing on them. And 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 that, and it's weaving all of that into event legacy programs. I, I, I think. Is, is what we have to do. And I actually think that presents a, another real opportunity for the sector. Mm. Uh, and Jennifer mentioned what some brands and what some corporates are looking for. Um, and maybe we want to talk about this a little bit later. I think it presents some real opportunities there as well. Um, mm. so, so I think I think this inequality issue will increasingly become uh, something that's important for the sector, something that will become an absolute necessity to be woven into event programs and how we articulate and present events but it can yeah, it also become a real asset yes yeah, so it does seem to be a sort of a, lo a logical next step in in the sort of um in the development of the, the legacy agenda that um having worked in the sector for, for, for 15 years now i mean it's it's, it's getting every every bid every, every sort of olympic cycle there's, there's a greater emphasis on some other um, different aspect of sort of uh, of hosting benefits and um, reaching the parts um, of, of all society is, is, is seems to be a, a logical um, place to go and um, I think there's probably an analogy here with with business events with with the meetings industry central um, thank you for, for your patience there I'm sorry I haven't um, asked you a question for, for a little while um, but um, it'd be great to get a perspective about how events like um, congresses and um, conventions can 
what role can they play in building, for example, knowledge economies? You know, you know, we talk about the, the Football World Cup um, getting people more active and playing football. That does does taking a cardiology congress to San Diego um, make people more aware of um, the importance of learning science, or, or or does it make them more aware of heart disease, or, or does you know, how how does that play out in, in your sector? Uh, thank you, Ben. I think uh, the meetings industry has been extensively, if you take the last decade over, has been working extensively with the local government, local policymakers on how to be integral part of the knowledge economy in any sector you take, whatever, whether it's like you rightly mentioned, whether it's in the scientific world or it can be in information technology. They, we all spoke about legacy a while ago. So the two main aspects of for the meetings uh, industry has been, even pre-pandemic was, leading a knowledge economy in every sector when you take a meeting to that particular city or the country and then leaving a legacy these are the being two fundamental pillars they have been working on constantly more and more associations even before uh, uh, even pre-pandemic level they've been working on these two concepts extensively so that the the knowledge segment that you take into that country it's not a it's not you're taking a meeting and then leaving yeah you bought a, a return on investment to the destination uh, thousand delegates when they 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 had all their expenditures in the country but that was uh, long before but in the last decade or so the knowledge economy has become so fundamental because each uh, bid or the rfp carries or the, uh, it requires what is the knowledge economy status if you bring the event to the city so you need to justify even before bidding for the event and also what's the legacy you're planning to leave in the destination so a lot of investments, a lot of knowledge economy development or the thought process developed in many countries are through business events. That's what even during pandemic, if you really see many governments thought if I reopen, I would reopen with a business event sooner because that builds or that kickstarts the local economy in different sectors, you know. So it brings the knowledge to the different sector, bring the expertise. How do I really enhance uh, reopening my destination? How do I uh, be within the health protocol? And then how do I really conduct my events using? So events, uh, business events have been key, key drivers and associations have taken a key focus on these area. And they're talking to the local host even at the bidding stage. And of course, like I said, a legacy has been other key factor. What kind of a strong legacy will leave in that destination so that the local community can benefit through that legacy. Mm. And, and from the association's point of view, how, how can they work to make sure that their activities are accessible to a wider proportion of, of society? I mean, yeah, so so some of the that, events are obviously clearly, clearly quite esoteric and, and, you know, not everyone's going to be able to understand um, a sort of um, you know, a scientific congress, of course. But um, nonetheless, I think that there is perhaps um, something you could say here about, about wider sort of um, benefit and reach. Yeah, absolutely. I think more and more the associations, what they're doing is that although you're confined to a certain segment of a scientific model, but we're also looking at uh, through these uh, initiatives of uh, sharing knowledge, economy, and legacy. They're looking at who are the other broader stakeholders can be can benefit. So, if you really see the RFPs compared to the last uh, five years and now, it it really mm -hmm. uh, asks you more deeper involvement by the local committee and local society. So, if I'm bringing a cardiology uh, congress to your destination, it's not only the scientific committee benefits through that. Who are the others who are engaging? Uh, it can be the, the local businesses, it can be wider community of volunteers, it could be wider community of scientific, uh, indirectly involved scientific schools, scientific community, or non-scientific as well from a financial point of view. How do they really engage with scientific community? So even the, the content of the program of these Congress have taken a shift, uh, more mm. focusing on community. You know. And you mentioned volunteering there. So how, how important is volunteering at, um, at some of these major Congresses? Uh, it, it's more than in ever. Community I think, development. Absolutely. In, for two reasons. One thing, one is for community developing, volunteering is important because that's where you go into the grassroots levels and engaging the local community to understand. My city is organizing a larger congress, and this is the thought process of that congress. What is the outcome of the congress? Message goes wider, other than the local community, other than the stakeholders involved. The volunteers carry the message across. Now that's one of the important aspect. But now due to pandemic. The skill factor, as there's a huge brain drain in our industry. So volunteering needs to be more and more encouraged so that we need to attract more people coming from other industry to our industry to understand, yes, this industry is here to stay and resiliently we will move back and we'll have larger events coming back. So we as ECA have been constantly encouraging young leadership programs, volunteering programs across uh, European cities and then rest of the world. From
primary so that we can build the skills and retain the skills when we are ready, much uh, ready to open uh, the destinations and of course organize larger events. Mm. Yes, it is. It is a challenge. It's sort of uh, around volunteering and skills, and even from our point of view as a as an event owner of of, of a business event, um, we receive emails from people saying, "Can we volunteer at Host City this year?" And we're thinking, "Oh, how can we do that in a digital environment? We haven't quite worked that that one out yet." Um, and yeah, it is a concern that um, is there going to be not quite a lost generation, but maybe two two or three years of, of people who have been less able to enter the events industry, which is probably a separate conversation, but it's a very important point. Thank you. Um, so, Billy, you were talking about, um, and, and Jennifer, both of you um, touched on the and the role of commercial sponsorship and the private sector more more broadly. Um, what's what's their role in this, or rather, what's the role of, of society to support to support their their aims as well? Um, how can local community activation help sponsors who might be under pressure to sort of to present themselves as 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 more authentic and align themselves with um, with the uh, I don't want to use the word worthy, but the, but the um, yeah, genuinely worthy ideals of um, of sports. Um, sorry, I don't know. If, I don't know who you want to go first there. Sorry. Um, oh, I, really? I, I'm going to say you go. First. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, the, the, the kind of commercial um, landscape has been really challenging in the last few years. Um, but I, I genuinely think, if you think about it, health and well-being tackling inequality, community engagement, social cohesion, the things that we've just been talking about, the things, our values, the things that we think events can deliver. Well, actually, I think that is fertile territory for a lot of brands and a lot of organisations and a lot of corporates out there. Um, you know, I think it's maybe not what's regarded as traditional territory for, for a lot of uh, brands and sponsors. You, you know, they're looking for, you know, eyes on, they're looking for elite, they're looking for kind of, um, you know, high profile, um, major, mega, etc. But I, th I think it, it's the way that a, a lot of brands are moving though, isn't it? I mean, a lot of brands, you know, are trying to position themselves um, across the sustainability agenda. A lot of brands are trying to, in a sense, detoxify, um, you know, if you look across the financial sector, if you look across the energy sector. And I think a lot of brands are also um, looking to introduce, in a sense, longevity and, and be clear that there's something that they can connect to and be associated with that has that has a real life before, during and after the event. And that's certainly some of the feedback that, that, that we've been getting. So I think there is an opportunity um, to connect around those values. And I think there's also a connect, an opportunity, again, talking from a host perspective, to connect in a, in a sense, existing host programs to an event and then present that as part of, if you like, an integrated package to a potential partner. Um, and that's something that we're exploring um, around the cycling in 2023. And that way you, you can, in a sense, share benefits, spread benefits, and maybe provide something for a potential partner that delivers you know, something that, that's a little bit unique that actually provides that brand with what they're really looking for. Um, whereas the event in itself and what's associated with the event maybe doesn't quite doesn't quite tick the boxes. So I think I think a focus on some of those values, a focus on some of those agenda items actually provides opportunities for us in terms of the commercial market. Mm. Interesting. Um, yeah. Jennifer? Oh. Yeah, I was going to say, I completely agree. I think, um, as, as Billy mentioned, I think consu or consumers are more savvy now. People are demanding more of brands and demanding more of companies. And I think there's definitely, as he said, still immense value in what I'll call kind of the traditional event sponsorship model, which is the big presenting sponsor, the ads, the signboards, paid placements, all that. But I think there's also value in coupling that with some sort of social impact component or some sort of community activation. Um, as long as the, the community is involved and wants that and it can be coordinated in a really authentic way. Um, a great example that comes to mind actually that has been working on for years is Target, which is a large retailer here in the United States, has been a supporter of the foundation um, for years and also supports Major League Soccer, their sponsor. And um, this past summer, which they've done for many years, but this summer as we were for a moment coming a little bit out, not out of the pandemic, but 
vaccines were rolled out and it was summer and people were outside and we could do things a little bit safer. Um, they were the presenting sponsor of All Star, but they, which was in Los Angeles. And they also had invested heavily in building uh, infrastructure and programs around the Los Angeles area. And in the lead up to MLS All Star, actually hosted large community activations where I think someone mentioned in the chat, yes, great, there's sometimes not opportunities to go to sporting events. In this case, it was going out to the communities that might not even know that All Star was coming because it was really focused downtown at the stadium. There was fan fest. It's not always accessible, but it's really opening up that wider audience. So for Target, they're reaching a lot more people in Los Angeles, but also bringing that experience and that um, high quality programming and fun and magic of the event to the communities in a really authentic way. And um, I think you know, that's opportunities for um, health and wellness opportunities. You know, we coupled it with this big kind of jamboree festival all over leading up into All Star. And they, you know, loved that, captured that. Their consumers care about that here in the US. So that even, you know, they mentioned that they did it and showed a highlight reel of the events at halftime. So they kind of coupled their traditional event sponsorship showing, you know, they care deeply about community. They've been very um, clear about that from the corporate social responsibility level and really coupled that they could do both. They could be that presenting sponsor. They could get the glitz and glam, but they could also make real change in the community. And I think, as Billy mentioned, if as event organizers can kind of work with corporations and create those type of opportunities where they can do both and really hit multiple business objectives, um, at least from what we're seeing in the United States, sponsors and corporations want that because consumers are calling on that and there's a real need to be more authentic and um, you know would wanna partake in that. And I think they have the buying power and they have the driving power that they can do that. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a great component to add to kind of that traditional glitz and glam of a major event. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. I think that's that's um, a really great place to to. Unfortunately, we're going to have to, to to leave the conversation now. I think actually we're we're running slightly over time, and and you know, we're just just getting warmed up. Um, I think we could talk for a lot longer on this. So, um, but um, yeah, thank you, Jennifer, for that. Um, you're absolutely right. It's about um, you know, fun and magic, and um, and how um, you know, health and wealth are, are are not mutually exclusive. In fact, they can be reinforcing one another. Thank you, Senfil, as well for your. Um, invaluable perspectives. Thank you, Billy, for your support. Um, can I just ask you all of you, actually, um, there, there are some questions on the chat and Jennifer, you alluded to one of them just then. But if you if you are able to, if you're on the um, the platform, just to perhaps answer the questions via the chat, if you, if you have um, a moment, I think um, our delegates will be very, very pleased to, to hear your, your views. And I'm sorry that I didn't um, pick up on those questions sooner. But um, yeah, thanks again for all your time. Great, great to, to hear from you, to speak with you today and hope, hope we can meet again soon.